Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Holly Rosewood, a program manager at the Pulitzer Center. As we wait for more people to join us, uh, feel free to let us know in the chat where you're joining us from. I myself am in a very stormy Maryland. Um, the panelists though are located all across the US, so we're really excited to have you here. If you haven't joined us before, the Pulitzer Center is a nonprofit journalism and education organization. We support more than 170 reporting projects each year in collaboration with news outlets around the world, then work with classrooms and um, public spaces to elevate engagement with these issues. We're based in DC, but our staff and our work is global. Just a few logistics before we get started today. You'll see a Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen. You can begin adding your questions for our speakers there at any time through the opening discussion. And there's also a chat icon on your screen. Um, we'd appreciate if you'd save that for specific tech issues and we can help you as soon as possible. We also wanted to let you know that we're recording this session and we'll post it online later this week. Um, and one other tech note, please stay a little bit longer once the session ends to participate in a brief survey. I'd like to briefly introduce today's speakers. Brendan Tausick is a photographer and filmmaker based in California who created the Pulitzer Center supported, can you hear that thunder? The Pulitzer Center supported multimedia digital documentary project Facing Life in partnership with journalist, author, and educator Pendarvis Harshaw. Harvey Galler is a co founder of the St. Louis Reentry Collective. He works with system impacted and non impacted people in the community to change the landscape of reentry. And Amy Bryan is a co director with the Missouri Office of the Roderick and Solange MacArthur Justice Center, a nonprofit civil rights law firm that fights for racial, gender, social, and economic justice through litigation on behalf of people in involved in the carceral and criminal legal systems. We're really happy to be hosting this conversation in collaboration with. Washington University's St. Louis Prison Education Project, which offers liberal arts experiences to incarcerated students at the Missouri Eastern Correctional Center and the Women's Eastern Reception, Diagnostic, and Correctional Center. Our conversation today also comes just a few days ahead of three performances in St. Louis of the Box. It's a play written by Sarah Short, a survivor of solitary confinement in collaboration with other survivors. Tickets are still available for the three St. Louis performances on July uh, 27th, 28th, and 29th. To start, I'm gonna turn things over to our panelists to share a little bit more about the work they do. Amy, could I start with you? Sure, thanks Holly, and uh, thanks for everyone who's attending today, including the other panelists. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, as Holly said, my name is Amy Bryan. I'm a co-director with the MacArthur Justice Center. Um, we have been in Missouri for about six years, um, but the work that I want to start talking about today actually predates that. Um, much of our work here in Missouri has been around parole, the parole system for adults and the parole system for individuals who were convicted when they were children. So 10 years ago is where this story starts when the Supreme Court issued a decision that said mandatory life without parole sentences are unconstitutional for kids, even when they commit very serious crimes, such as first degree murder. And in arriving at this decision, of course, the court looked at precedent, which supposedly mattered at that point anyway, and considered the developmental differences between adults and children. Um, it, it you know, considered and weighed the uh, science and um, biology of adolescent development, including the fact that children are more impulsive and reckless, that they are driven by reward and they're less deterred by risk. They're more susceptible to outside pressures, especially peer pressures. And this is in part because of their brain chemistry and you know, the stage of development at which they're in until their early 20s. Um, so they're more susceptible to commit crimes, especially when they are in these peer groups. Um, and less able to sort of stop once the ball gets rolling. At the same time, a teenager's character is less fixed than an adult and anyone who has, you know, grown up and turned 30, 40, 50 can attest to being very different from 
the way that they were when they were 14 or 15 or 16 in terms of how they make decisions. And all of these characteristics are mitigating characteristics of youth. They make life without parole and, and other extreme sentences excessive for, in the court's view, all but the rarest juvenile offender. When you look at the population of individuals who are serving time for juvenile life without parole or jail WAP as we sometimes call it, um, certain really heartbreaking trends stand out and support this narrative of youth as a mitigator. According to, to research by the Campaign for Fair Sentencing of Youth, nearly 80% of juvenile lifers reported witnessing violence in their homes. Black youth are sentenced to life without parole as children at a per capita rate 10 times that of white youth. Um, unsurprisingly, racial bias permeates every single aspect of the criminal punishment system, including, including juvenile life without parole sentences. And in the city of St. Louis, which in the state of Missouri has the largest population of juvenile lifers, 98% of them were black. Most of them black boys that were sentenced during the super predator era of the early 90s. 80% of girls and nearly half of all children sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole have been physically abused. And 77% of girls and 20% of all juvenile lifers have been sexually abused. This population, as I said, in Missouri, it was about 100 individuals who um, in, in many instances had these similar traumatic backgrounds, were serving life without parole. And after this decision from the Supreme Court in 2012, suddenly had hope for release that they hadn't had before. Um, but it wasn't until 2016 that Missouri passed the law making them eligible for parole after 25 years. All they had to do was go before the parole board and convince the parole board to release them, which if you know anything about the Missouri Parole Board is easier said than done. The Missouri Parole Board has been criticized historically as being highly secretive, um, paranoid to the extreme is how a former board operation manager put it. Um, making arbitrary decisions. And so we at MacArthur were very concerned about what would happen with these cases when they went up for parole review. And side note, I've got here in my notes, don't sleep on the parole board, okay? They oversee over 15,000 people in the state of Missouri. Revocations account for between a half to a third of new prison admissions in the state of Missouri. There are little to no qualifications to be on the parole board. And Yet parole decisions, whether you're making a decision whether to release someone from prison or send them back to prison for violating their parole, they're a huge driver in mass incarceration. So we were very concerned that the, the folks were not going to get a really meaningful chance at release um, in front of the parole board. And sadly, that turned out to be true. What we saw was that the vast majority of juvenile offenders who went up to the parole board were being denied parole based off of the seriousness of their offense. So we filed a lawsuit and in August of 2019, we won um, a groundbreaking suit holding the parole board accountable for providing a meaningful and realistic opportunity for release. Um, and one that's based on demonstrated maturity over time. We got new procedures for the board, we got training for the board. And with these changes went from about an 86% denial rate to over a 96% grant rate. 34 people have been released, 13 more are scheduled to get out in the next one or two years. And this Thursday, Norman Brown will walk out of prison. He's the last of the lead plaintiffs in that case. Um, and Norman was a barely 15 year old unarmed co-defendant to an older male father figure at the time of his crime. He'll have served 28 years um, and four days, I believe, when he gets out this Thursday. Sadly, in Missouri and in other states, we can still give kids a life without parole sentence, which it's a death sentence, just with a different name, let's be honest. And the United States is actually the only country in the entire world that still sentences kids to life without parole. So although we had this great victory in this one case, it far from solves the problem. And today there are still hundreds, over 500 juvenile offenders locked up in the state of Missouri serving extreme sentences. One very notable case is that of Bobby Bostick. Um, his name has been in the paper recently because he's a tremendous advocate for himself and others serving extreme sentences. He's serving 241 years for a, a robbery where no one was killed, 
um, and his sentences are what they call stacked, they're consecutive, so that he has no realistic opportunity to get out, um, you know, before the end of his life. Um, there are lots of other folks like him who've got these, what we call de facto life sentences, which is just a, a term of years so great that there's no realistic chance that the individual will get out, no matter what they do, no matter how much they change, no, how, no matter how ready they are to be released. Um, there's also, uh, in the state of Missouri, there was a very long fight to raise the age to 18, but we still have not adapted our laws to recognize what scientists tell us, which is that adolescents, these same mitigating factors of youth, they extend into the early 20s. The state of Missouri is actually asking for an execution date for a young man who was only 18 at the time of his crime and who also had a documented mental impairment that exacerbated the, chemi the developmental attributes um, attributed to his youth. Apparently, we like to think that calling an unconstitutional practice by a different name makes it okay somehow, but arose by any other name, as they say. And the same thing happens with solitary confinement. You know, it's not solitary, it's ad seg or disciplinary seg, protective custody, mass assault status, a secure housing unit, restrictive housing unit, but no matter what you call it, the practice remains the same for months years, even decades, a single human is confined to a bathroom-sized cage for 23 hours a day. Estimates are, there are estimates that between 80,000 to 100,000 people endure solitary confinement in state and federal prisons. It happens just down the street from where I'm sitting at the City Justice Center in St. Louis. Um, I don't have time. I was going to read a declaration from someone there about it, um, but it's well known that solitary causes significant harm, even a day or two in solitary confinement can cause significant harm and decompensation. Um, and just like life without parole inflicted on juveniles, just like every other aspect of the criminal punishment system, it too is biased and is disproportionately inflicted on black people, Latinx people, native people, and other people of color. Um, so those are a little bit of the, the issues that MacArthur is working around related to solitary, solitary and parole, juvenile parole stop now. Thank you, though. Thank you so much, Amy, and apologies. Uh, briefly lost my power, but we are back. Um, Harvey, could I turn to you next to talk about what you're um, doing in St. Louis? Yeah, absolutely, Holly. Thank you. Um, and thank you, everyone else, for uh, being here, and thank you to the other panelists. Um, my name is Harvey Galler. I'm formerly incarcerated. Um, I'm from the St. Louis area. I've spent time, I've done time in a couple of different states, Virginia, Florida, and Missouri. Uh, this last time while I was in, I was lucky enough to actually be able to participate in Washington University's prison education project and earn my uh, AA in 2019. I was released that following December. And after my release, I was able to uh, work with the prison education project, help develop a reentry program that they now call the alumni program. I was working with them, help trying to figure out um, what, what reentry looks like for a prison and ed education program. You know, a higher education and, and uh, 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 a college program looks like in prison, right? What reentry looks like for that? So, because they had no clue what that would look like. Um, and it, amazing enough, they have all the resources, it's just having access to those resources and being able to like put people into connection with those resources with as much. Uh, uh, access to the stuff that they have. So anyways, um, I, I worked with uh, the Prison Education Project for a little while. And then um, I, I decided that uh, it was just, there, there were like uh, just conflicts that I had with the, with the ed Prison Education Project. And that, it wasn't the, the program itself, it was uh, more rather the, the politics of the university. They weren't necessarily matching what needed to be done. So. Um, uh, I formed uh, the St. Louis Reentry Collective with a couple other people that were in the Prison Education Project. And since then, we've uh, helped create a resource guide that focuses on resources and services that cater to formerly incarcerated folk in the St. Louis area as they're reentering society. Also, um, we raised uh, a little over $100,000 and distributed to individuals that needed direct cash assistance during COVID and things like that, uh, formerly incarcerated folk. And we did this all on like, like $10, $20 donations as well. These weren't like very large donations. And we've only been around for like two years. 
Um, also, during that time, um, I was going to uh, uh, Washington University. Uh, it, everything went virtual, and it was very hard for me to deal with like uh, going to school and, and the whole virtual component. I was used to. I was. I was. I was lucky enough to be in a higher education prison program that actually had professors that came into the institution, into the prison, that actually met with us and taught us and we could have conversations with them. We could, we could ask them, we can engage them about the materials. So when I got out and everything went virtual, it was really hard for me to adjust to that kind of, even though I was isolated, it was the, just the virtual component was very hard for me to get used to that. Um, and it added to my sense of isolation that I already had, because uh, while I was incarcerated, I had, uh, I've done several stints in the whole solitary confinement as well. Um, sometimes it was in there with other individuals. I think a four was like the largest, uh, the most I've ever been in a cell, single cell with in, in isolation. And then there was also like a single cell isolation cells. But anyway, so uh, I, I didn't really, I wasn't necessarily, um, I wasn't working out with the, the virtual component. It wasn't necessarily mesh, meshing with me. So I actually ended up dropping out of school, but while I was still going to school, I took a, um, a, uh, a introductory to video class and, and I interviewed, interviewed a couple of the people that I had gotten out of prison with. And I realized that this, this could be uh, made in something a little bit more impactful. So I ended up uh, writing a grant to um, get money to put together a documentary series based on the stories and narratives of formerly incarcerated folk as we're returning back into the community. Um, I know in myself, I've been in and out of prison several times, and I know that the reentry services are, are lacking, not just in St. Louis, but nationally as well. Some of them are a little bit better than others. But they're still lacking because recidivism rates nationally are are, ex, are are way too high. If if a if if something else was operating at like a forty percent uh, failure rate, that that system wouldn't be around anymore. For some reason, all these numbers are like are right around forty percent for the recidivism rate, and these reentry programs are operating as if they're successful. That's not really success in my eyes. So what? What I started realizing is like, okay, maybe I could use these videos to put together um, a reentry program that is impactful based on what we say our, our personal successes and our barriers are as we come back into society, whether they be systemic or personal, I should say. So um, yeah, so I started putting together the documentary um, and through that, uh, Surprisingly enough, none of the people that I've interviewed have had a hard time like finding a job or getting connected with housing. These are all barriers that we do have, yes, but these are things that we can find. The things that um, I saw that were lacking in reentry services and programs were uh, trauma components. A lot of us uh, suffer you know, people that have been in solitary confinement for a very long time. They're returning to society. When you get released from solitary confinement, the institution doesn't do anything to kind of roll back what they've done to you for isolating you for all that trauma. And then they release you back onto the streets. So that, that, that makes it hard for us to actually use these other resources that we do have, housing, employment, all these other things, if we don't have, if we can't actually function in society to even, to even stay in a safe house. Because what if safe housing, if, if I'm there by myself and, I, and, and I'm so impacted by the trauma, I can't really function. So I realized that, um, and I also had some really close friends that had these resources met and they were still back in the streets and struggling. So um, um, the, first, the first workshop that I've put together based off of what um, people have said in these interviews is a trauma workshop. And that's based off of uh, trauma that we uh, receive while we're incarcerated and how it affects us as we return back into society. Um, another component that uh, is similar across is, um, is imposter syndrome and loss of purpose. Uh, we, when, when we're in prison in solitary confinement and isolation and things, you don't have any purpose. And on top of it, the prison system is telling you what your purpose is. Uh, and, and when we turn back to society, a lot of people tell us that our purpose is in our job. Well, most, of, most society doesn't find purpose in their job alone. They have, they, they're volunteers. They, they participate in the community. So that's my next focus on the next workshop that I'm be putting together is uh, 
is a workshop based on community building from a formerly incarcerated standpoint. There are studies that show also that volunteerism from formerly incarcerated folk as a return back to the society reduces our recriminalization and our rearrest rates as well, as opposed to us just going out and being told where we fit in society. Through volunteering, we gain a sense of purpose. We learn where we fit. We can also use our voice to help make society and that community in a way that helps include us as well by, by volunteering and being visible and showing and breaking these stigmas that like that keep us in these uh, uh, these cycles of, of recriminalization and rearrest and things like that. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, I guess that's a lot. Uh, that's where I am now. Um, uh, also, I do work with uh, the Educational Development Center, which is a uh, national organization that is uh, trying to figure out new avenues to advocate for uh, STEM opportunities in prison for uh, currently incarcerated folk right now as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, Harvey. I'm excited to hear more about the work you're doing. And before I turn to Brandon, um, just wanted to remind folks that if you do have questions at any time throughout these, uh, you know, our opening presentations, please feel free to add them to the Q&A. I see that a few are already answered, but, um, you know, really excited to open this discussion. So, Brandon, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I'm going to screen share here. So, my name is Brandon Tauzik, and I am going to chat my project link right here in our chat so you can scroll through them if you want as I talk. There you go. So my name is Brandon Talzik. I'm a photographer and filmmaker based in California. And the person that you just saw in that photograph on the right is Pendarvis Harshaw, who is my partner uh, on this project that was funded by the Pulitzer Center called Facing Life. Um, in the early 2000s, California's prison system housed more than 170,000 people, which was 199% of the capacity which it was designed to hold. So the Supreme Court in 2011 deemed that the health conditions in California's prisons were unconstitutional and in a violation of the Eighth Amendment and that they had to decrease significantly the prison population. Um, I think the request was close to 100, at least 120. So over the course of the past 15 years or so, uh, California legislators and voters via ballot measures have pushed through different pieces of legislation uh, aimed at reducing the state's prison population, AKA releasing people from prison. Um, a lot of people that they have released were and have been lifers. So uh, in 2018, uh, myself and Pendarvis set out to make a multimedia kind of digital documentary project profiling the reentry experiences of eight former lifers as they were coming out of California prisons and reentering into communities around the state. Um, the audience for the project is really threefold. You know, one, just kind of everyday people, voters that, you know, make a difference at the ballot. Um, whether that's here in California or in states like, you know, Missouri and Kansas, that uh, some of this legislation is also now starting to happen um, so that it can be kind of just a bit of a perspective shift on uh, the challenges that lifers face and kind of their, their backgrounds, their upbringings, and really like what they came from. Um, second would be also for legislators. So for people, you know, in our state or in other states that are looking to potentially, you know, write and pass legislation that would release more lifers. So showcasing this, uh, you know, again, as experience and a perspective shift. And third, also for currently and formerly incarcerated people. So, um, you know, for currently incarcerated people, uh, hearing voices from people on the other side, from people that did serve 20, 30, 40 years and are now out, you know, learning from their firsthand struggles, uh, their experiences, um, personal and you know external. Um, so that was really kind of our, our threefold audience goal with the project. We released it in April and it's been kind of making the rounds on the internet. We'll be exhibiting it around the state in person in the fall. Um, so we're kind of ticking through here um, our, some of our eight participants. Uh, we had eight people, five men, three women. Um, we wanted to uh, 
represent you know, different areas of the state, so northern, central, and southern. We wanted to represent men and women, different races, but also we really wanted to um, overrepresent the female story because the female story tends to get lost within stories of mass incarceration for male stories. So we were able to do that with finding three women that wanted to participate. And we basically just followed them around throughout their daily lives for over the course of about three years and kind of, you know, into the pandemic, um, charting their ups, their downs, their employment, their housing, um, you know, all the things that, that make up, you know, rebuilding a life, relationships with family, you know, rekindling those relationships, marriages, um, and, you know, also with, with Pendarvis's reporting, we also dug into um, their youth, their upbringing, um, you know, all, all, most, actually all of our eight participants, um, their committing offenses were either when they were a teenager and they were tried as an adult, as kind of Amy was touching on, or they were in their early 20s. Um, so I am going to play a quick video from Treviel talking about his home life. 45 seconds. There was a touch of dysfunction. There was drug use in the home. Um, there was domestic violence in the home, you know, alcoholism in the home. Um, my mom, she did the, her best to, to shield me and my sister from it. You know, so the, the man in our lives is who brought the dysfunction. You know, my mom had a couple of marriages, you know, failed marriages and those were the men that basically were in the home, you know, and they would, one was addicted to, got addicted to drugs, and the other one was an alcoholic, dealing with, 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 with that type of, of individual, you know, the, the emotions and the, you know, the anger control, you know, is <laughs> epic. So you can see, you know, that was, that was a relatively common thread um, for, for the participants in our project. And, you know, Treviel was a teenager at the time of his offense and received a, a life sentence. So, you know, beyond um, pre-incarceration, obviously the big focus of the, the project was post-incarceration um, and, you know, the struggles and challenges that uh, are, are brought up, you know, entering a society basically for the first time as an adult. Um, you know, having been been put away as a as a teenager or someone in their early twenties. So um, here we're gonna hear briefly from Myra on um, housing stress, which is, which is a really big issue um, for formerly incarcerated people, particularly people in California, where the cost of housing is so high. I want to buy me a house, but I'm going to get me another job and save more money, so I can function out here. By myself, like I said, there's no place that I can get an apartment. I can't even rent a room at the prices that rent is in the city. But then nobody's trying to help me. Nobody's trying to help me find a place to stay. The uh, Section 8 waiting list is ridiculous. It's anywhere from five to 10 years. Uh, low income housing is booked to the nine. You know, there's no place to go after the SLE. I'm not a veteran. You know, I'm a straight up single woman. And I'll probably be predominantly homeless if I don't find something between now and when that six months is up. So as you can hear, you know, the 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 struggles are are real and and very serious in nature. Um, you know, a lot of lifers come out and, and do end up homeless. Um, Myra, I visited her last month. Um, you know, we're still in touch with, with everyone, even though the project is technically over. They've just kind of become friends and we text each other all the time. She just moved in with her partner into an apartment. She's doing great. She's working like four jobs at once. She's exhausted, but she did not end up homeless and she is loving every moment of her freedom. And then lastly, um, kind of on, you know, what resources, you know, a big question of the project is, you know, what, what are folks re-entering to, you know, uh, is it the state that's providing resources? Obviously the answer would be largely no. Uh, is it nonprofits? Is it individuals? So here's a, a minute clip of Lynn uh, suggesting on what the, the state of California could do better for lifers re-entering. I think um, on a state level, when it comes to before you're released, 
um, some of the who, what, where, when, why is like, how you get, how do you get a social security card? How do you get an ID? How do you obtain a birth certificate if you haven't have one? How do you reestablish credit? Um, those type of basic things. How do you reestablish a bank account? Because if you've been in for 10 or more years, I found you're, you're like a ghost in the machine. So you're basically starting from scratch over. So how do you do that? How do you navigate that? Um, that again, that would be on a state level prior to you being released. Um, that would be extremely helpful, even if there was just information on it, because you kind of, if you didn't have friends or family that had gone out before you to pave that way, you're really going out with blindly. And it's, it's challenging how to do since the computers and technologies, it seems to be ever evolving. Um, that's been a roadblock too, but that would really be helpful on a state correctional level to have that. So uh, yeah, those are just, you know, a few of the voices of the project. I encourage you to, to check it out and, you know, read some of the reporting, um, the cinemagraphs, some of the 360 VR clips and um, yeah, hear firsthand from from what's going on with life for reentry. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much, Brandon. Um, it's really an incredible project. And I think, you know, a good thing to kind of end on before we get into questions. Um, just a reminder that, you know, everyone has different experiences um, and, you know, what we see is not always the reality. Um, what uh, Lynn was saying too about, you know, things that can be done um, you know, during incarceration so that people are not so left out, um, you know, I think is a great segue into this question that we have from Meg in the chat here that um, is for Harvey and asks, uh, Harvey, how you would adapt your approach to trauma-related programming when designing a pre-release workshop for those who are still incarcerated. Um, I don't know if you have a good well, I know. answer to that right now. Well, but. I have, I, I saw that, I saw it when it came up and I started thinking about it. And it's something I've been thinking about as well. Um, in working with uh, the Prison Education Project, how do you incorporate like a trauma, something trauma informed inside? Because really it's such a, it's a culture that we inside don't even like really talk about our feelings. Sometimes we like, um, we might uh, become really close friends with someone and we share like a certain amount of our feelings with that individual but it's still like very hard for us to like openly cry or even express like any happiness you know joy that we're like uh feeling you know we th those are those are very simple feelings but we're not allowed to express them on the inside so really being able to like break that down i don't know how to break that component down in the culture but i know um it, at least for like a, a re-entry program provide a space where um the currently incarcerated folk can talk about the trauma that they're going through while they're incarcerated uh, freely without being uh, persecuted or put back in the hole because they're complaining about how a CO is talking about them or or some kind of systematic issue or policy that like keeps sending them back to the hole. Um, yeah, create, and I don't know how a, a program would do that because I know they have to kind of like play nice with the Department of Corrections in any state when they're getting in and and no uh, state is really going to allow like a a program to uh, have a space for people just to talk crap about the institution because they don't want they don't want uh, the VICs and the volunteers and other people to come inside to actually know the reality of what's going on in there. So they try to keep the communications that we do have with them limited and what we can talk to them about. Obviously, we talk to them about other things that are that are more uh, important and they're more severe. We talk to them about our trauma, but being able to create a space where we can talk about our trauma safely is, I think that would be like the first step in, in some way that it's not attached to like, uh, uh, the, the system and like how what we say can be reported back. And then those things, like I said, uh, and also, um, uh, create like a program where people are, are, are forced to journal where the, and then, and then analysis of that journaling throughout their, throughout their reentry. So they're thinking about their reentry and then hopefully they can incorporate, you know, what they're going on, what's going on in their head during that day, you know, uh, and, 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 and analyze it uh, and maybe see if there's like some kind of like trauma that they've uh, received while they're incarcerated um, that is keeping them from doing something or realizing something. But yeah, that, that's what I would suggest. Yeah, thanks Harvey. Um, you know, I think 
and, and in ways that kind of speaks to Amy, what you were saying about some of these systems being highly secretive and highly opaque, you know, by design. Um, and I'd kind of like to open this up to everyone, but Amy, maybe starting with you, um, I'd like to know a little bit more about how you navigate that in the work that you do. And then later on, I would love to hear more from Brandon and Harvey too, about, you know, how do you work with, work around this system and these systems that have, you know, really tried to exclude um, people for, for many reasons? Yeah. Um... That's a good question, and it's not, you know it, it's actually something that I myself and a lot of folks that I work alongside find challenging, which is that um, in order to you know sort of fight against the system, we have to operate within the system, and to what extent is that like reinforcing it? Um, whether it's like playing nice with DOC because it inures to the benefit of our clients, or even just you know upholding law that you know, maybe feels illegitimate, illegitimate, um, but um, using it as a tool to our advantage and our client's advantage. Um, I, I mean, with respect to the specific aspect of um, like opaque parole processes, um, you know, that's something that we, we are primarily a litigation shop. And so we challenge through litigation, um, try to get people in the door, um, and you know, also try to get creative and and think of other ways to attack the problem. Whether you know, sharing information out through to organizers and other folks who might be able to you know bring some action outside of the courthouse. Um, you know, steps whether it's through legislative ad advocacy or or you know generally organizing campaigns um, because litigation is a powerful tool, but it's not it's not always. Um, the right tool and, and certainly never, in my opinion, the right tool in and of itself for affecting meaningful change. Um, and definitely not, you know, it doesn't move quickly. You'll, you'll note that, you know, the Miller decision was 10 years ago and people are, are still locked up in Missouri serving unconstitutional sentences. Um, so ho yeah, hopefully that answers your question. I was thinking actually, Harvey, you know, we've had clients who said that um, they're convicted of a sex offense and like in one, prison course, they're required to journal, but then, you know, that journal is read by their institutional parole officer and they can be punished for what's in their journal. So very much like to the extent that there are those kinds of resources that are trauma informed, they seem to just be part of another way to super, you know, supervise and punish uh, the people who are incarcerated. Yeah, thanks for, for pointing that out, Amy. Um, I don't know, Brandon, Harvey, um, would either of you like to talk about kind of how you navigate these spaces? Um, well, I mean, that's why we, we uh, you know, when Padarvis and I were, were thinking about working together on a project around mass incarceration, we had some ideas that were, uh, you know, inside, um, but the difficulty uh, that we would have had to overcome and the censorship that's why we, we pivoted to reentry so we could have, you know, absolute freedom of movement with who we profile and, and what we say. And we did receive some cooperation from um, the parole department in like linking us with some people and everything like that. But ultimately, you know, we had total control over the project in a way that we wouldn't have if we were making it, you know, inside. Um, speaking to what Amy was talking about earlier about journaling and and uh, just even if you aren't in those classes where you in, in where you are forced to journal if if you're just keeping a journal yourself and you just happen to have like a regular like safety cell search and and the CO just happens to go through your journal and just happens to read this then you're thrown in and and if they think it's alarming enough they will throw you in a solitary confinement and put you into the hole where you're not just put into like solitary confinement where you like have like um an outfit on like a scrub like a nurse would wear you're thrown into solitary confinement where you're in a cell completely by yourself but naked with um this like really hard green velcro material that really isn't very comfortable or is they dehumanize you so uh, it, it is hard for to address trauma in prison and it's very i, I don't know what the question would be what, what an easy answer is to this because of these institutional policies 
that keep us from feeling comfortable and safe with, a, with talking about these things. And it even carries over once we get out. It, it carries over once we get out as well. Yeah, um, you know, maybe sticking with what you said, Harvey, too, about, you know, that version of solitary. I know mm -hmm. um, when we kind of chatted before this event, just to, you know, talk about what we wanted to talk about, um, Amy, you and Harvey both, you know, talk through kind of how, um, how many different versions there are. Um, and, you know, sometimes things aren't officially uh, solitary confinement, but, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, they are. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, just for folks who maybe don't have um, that understanding of how that works, if, if maybe, Amy, you could provide some background or uh, Harvey even. Go ahead, Amy, I'll let you speak. Okay, <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so, you know, we litigated a case um, in the Southern, in, in Southern Illinois, um, St. Clair County, where uh, our client who was a, a teenager was held at the juvenile detention center for 10 months. And for eight of those months, he was in a cell by himself, in a wing by himself, allowed out at most for one hour every day. Otherwise, in his cell locked for 23 hours a day, he would eat his meals in his cell. And the jail was adamant, we don't do solitary confinement, you know, but I forget what they called it, segregation or protective custody, right, Harvey, or like the secure housing unit. Um, when, if you're in a cell 23 hours a day, you know, if it's 23 to one, in 23, out one, by yourself, that's solitary confinement. Whether you call it that or not, it's going to have the same um, significant impact on your physical and, and your mental health. Um, so I don't know if they call it by a different name because they're drinking the Kool-Aid and think they can get away with it, but it, it, it's used so commonly um, and it's often used in a way that punishes people who, for seeking help or for just having symptoms of mental illness and sort of acting out on those. Or we have clients who, you know, are asking for help and get punished for just asking for help, so, you know, to see a doctor, to see a counselor, something like that. Um, and the, the studies, studies tend to show that it really doesn't do anything to increase the safety of facility to the extent that it's held out as some sort of necessary disciplinary mechanism for safety and security. It's just not true. Um, so yeah, it, it has many different names, but at the end of the day, if you're locking a human being in a, a bathroom size cell for 23 hours at a time, it's solitary confinement. Harvey didn't want to cut you off if you're saw you leading forward. <laughs> no, 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 you're fine. Um, yeah, solitary confinement is a whole other monster. And uh, yeah, sometimes um, it could be solitary or it could be um, so... I don't know what they're calling it now, but the St. Louis Community Release Center, it's essentially, it's a halfway house. It's, um, it's got barbed wire around it and it has what they call um, segregation. It's, but there are four to five man cells that are the size of like a room that you could fit two bunk beds in that they're keeping five people in. Five people in these like small tiny cells at a place where the, the parole board has deemed fit you're allowed to go out to society and you can come and go, you're, you're allowed to come and go to work, things like that, but still they have segregation in a, in a facility like this to use as like behavior modifications. I just don't, and, and, and like Amy was saying, it doesn't do anything for, it's not a behavior modification because when you get to certain facilities where there's overcrowding, the whole is, it ultimately becomes like a way for people to like channel out of bed space. So it's not really, um, it's, it's not really something that they use as punishment. It's just, it's, it's a bureaucratic thing that they use to kind of like make people feel comfortable with like the language they're using and how they're using it, essentially. Yeah, I think I'd like to, you know, talk a little bit more about that and about, you know, the language that we hear and these like public um, images that we have of a lot of these systems. Uh, you know, we got this question from Kevin Winhauser who's at the Prison Education Project about, um, you know, common public misconceptions 
about the American criminal legal system, um, especially surrounding issues like solitary confinement and humane sentencing, et cetera. Um, you know, I think this is something that I'd, I'd love to hear each of you talk a little bit about since you all are kind of like working on different sides of this. Um, you know, what are some of the things that you frequently run into as these misconceptions and how do you work around them or how, I mean, what ideas do you have to get over that obstacle? Um, let's open it to anyone. No, that's a big question, but thank you for that one, Kevin. Um, I think the biggest misconception that, that I encounter as um, a prisoner's rights advocate is that prisons reduce crime or that prisons keep us safe. Um, and, and then just the general dehumanizing of our clients. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's really easy for folks who don't work in this space or have a loved one, family member who's incarcerated to kind of forget because we build these prisons in largely in rural spots of the state of Missouri where they're sort of out of sight, out of mind. Um, and yet, like some of the most amazing people I've ever met are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated. Um, and so I, I love like Brandon's work and Harvey's work, um, you know, the idea of telling more stories, especially in compelling like visual ways uh, so that other people can see the, the human side um, to some of these issues. And, and, you know, someone doesn't stop being human being once they go um, inside prison. Um, so always reminding folks of, of the human side of incarceration and the stories, um, you know, behind bars. We've, we've done some of that work with our juvenile lifers as they've been released, putting um, some video testimonials together to, to try to push the narrative a little bit so, so folks are more sympathetic and understanding. Um, but it's a big challenge, especially in a very uh, conservative culture like that in the state of Missouri. Thank you for sharing that, Amy. Um, Brandon, I'll maybe pass it to you next since Amy is talking about your work. Yeah, I think, you know, related to facing life, you know, life or reentry, you know, our project, um, whether you serve five or, or 50 years in California, you get $200 in gate money and you have to uh, secure six months of transitional home housing. And after that, you know, you have to be um, completely self-sufficient as far as employment, rent, housing, food, everything. Um, and, you know, the, beyond assigning you a parole officer, uh, that's about all you get from the state. Um, and what we found in, in a lot of cases is this real each one reach one kind of underground railroad system of other former lifers helping other former lifers from basic things like how to get an ID to giving someone a ride to, you know, uh, helping someone get employment. Um, so and that's all unpaid. That's all just total volunteer labor of love. Um, that they're doing to help, you know, their brothers and sisters, you know, uh, successfully reenter. So that that was kind of one thing that I think might be a misconception, you know, related to our project is that um, it's formerly incarcerated people that we found are are doing the most help for formerly incarcerated people, you know, not the state. I think one of the biggest misconceptions that I run across is that um, recriminalization and rearrest is like completely predicated on negative behaviors based upon the individual. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is there's like thousands of collateral consequence laws and policies that keep uh, formerly incarcerated folk or system impacted folk from transitioning or even being successful in the community. So the, the cards are stacked against us. So when they see us fail a lot of the times, they think it's something that we've done wrong and they attribute it to, oh, I've done it so they can do it as well. Well, it's in the, the pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality doesn't necessarily work so well with formerly incarcerated folk because the system is meant for us to end up back in prison. It's not meant for us to be successful and be meaningful citizens back in society. So I think that that is the largest misconception is that like recriminalization and those things are predicated on, on us solely and what our, our actions are as we return back into the community. Thank you. Yeah, um, Brandon, you know, you mentioned 
a lot of that volunteer work and just all the efforts being made by formerly incarcerated people who are doing a lot of that work um, on their own without any institutional support. And it reminded me, you know, Harvey, what you said today when we last spoke about the incredible amount of individual donor support you've received. Um, I just think that, I mean, that's amazing to have that much support. And I think you said two years. Um, and, you know, a lot of the questions that we get in these type of events is, you know, well, what can I do? I think that's a pretty obvious, you know, way to support people. Um, and it, it proves that, you know, that support does help, but um, just kind of wanted to open it up and see if there's other advice any of you have for people who may be watching this now or maybe watching the recording on other ways they can learn or help, um, even if it even if it seems very small. I mean, at least in, in California, you know, um, and it's on our um, on the special thanks page uh, on our on our project facing life. You know, we received um, advice and you know just um, connections from a lot of really amazing reentry organizations that exist here in California, uh, and they're all listed on our special thanks page. But you know, if you wanted to get involved and volunteer, there's Anti Recidivism Coalition, Asian Prisoner Support Committee, um, Rising Sun, Root and Rebound. And then on the policy side, kind of nationwide, the, the sentencing project, among others. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah, I know you shared the link to um, the project in chat, but highly encourage people to check it out. Yeah, there's, uh, like Brandon was saying, there's all kinds of uh, local uh, grassroots organizations, small organizations that are that need volunteers and, and um, just your time, really. That's important, you know, just, just give us a chance. Yeah. Thanks, Harvey. And thanks, Amy, for sharing uh, those links in chat. I think it might just go into host and panelists. I'm going to copy and share it to everyone. But um, some really great places to donate. Um, thank you, Michaela. But is there anything else you wanted to share? I just wanted to give. This, this program a, a, a shout out. So uh, San Luis University has been a uh, program through their occupational therapy school that um, has been just tremendously helpful for most of our clients of reentry with things that were mentioned earlier, like getting a birth certificate, social security card, learning like how to ride a city bus um, and, you know, how like how to take public transportation and, um, you know, how to look for a job um basic things that i think some of us take for granted um but which our clients really had to, had to learn for the first time because they had never lived on their own you know being teenagers when they went in um and having been in for decades um the world is, is really different now than it was in the 80s and 90s so um i yeah uh, if, if folks are looking to help and have some cash to grow um after they donate to to harvey and brandon they should donate to otis Thank you all. Um, we are somehow already getting to the end of our time, but um, for a last question, I kind of wanted to go back to Harvey, you mentioned, you know, how individual success is different um, for every single person and, and the barriers are different for every single person. Um, and, you know, it was a very big question, but I'm curious, you know, to hear from, from anyone what an idea of success could look like to you doesn't need to be the end all be all but um you know is there something that kind of keeps you rooted in what you're doing or is there something near term long term that you see as a point of success and what and what you work on um, my success i don't i really don't know what success, i know what success looks like from like a capitalistic standpoint right like having all these like things in bobbles and like bright i don't know um but success for me, I know, is just like knowing that like I'm I feel comfortable out here and I feel like I'm in a space where like um, I feel like I belong. Right. But I've had to like kind of create this space for myself. So also uh, I, I really don't know. Um, it is different for people. And I, and I don't necessarily think I've reached that like goal of success for myself. I've been out longer than I've ever like I've, my longest period of like 
uh, stay between like periods of incarceration was a year. I've been out two and a half years now. So um, that could be like a, a, a gauge of success for some people. I don't, I don't know what it is yet. Uh, is it, I don't even know what happiness is yet, right? So like, I think like once I start realizing these things and maybe I'll be able to like create like a measure of success for myself. Thank you. I don't know, Amy, Brandon, are there things in your work that you know you see as milestones or Brandon, obviously I don't want you to speak for the folks that you interviewed, but I don't know if there's anything particularly interesting you'd want to share. I mean, I think getting off parole was a big deal for, for all eight of our participants and, and all eight are now fully off parole, which is also kind of termed as prison on paper. Um, so they are, you know, fully out of the system, and that was uh, for each of them like a really big celebration. Um, yeah, I mean, every time we have a client get released, you know, it's just um, the best feeling in the world because I'm so used to going to prison for to visit with clients and then leaving and leaving them there, um, and those are really hard, hard visits. Um, you know, hard goodbyes and the like joy and relief of and and sort of bittersweet, you know, kind of moment also of, of them getting out um, is uh, is is just great. It's um, those are great days and um, they help like power through on the days when you feel like the system is is you know too much and that. Um, the losses are too many, um, keeping in mind that, you know, my client got to have Christmas dinner with his family for the first time in like 35 years. I think little things like that um, are, you know, for me, successes. Wow, thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, I, I'm, I'm just very, very thankful for each of you for sharing your time with us today. Um, and, you know, we have this resource now that I hope will be really helpful to folks in the future. Um, I just, yeah, thank you. And, and thank you to everyone in our audience. Um, if you are able, I know we've got a lot of great uh, places to support, but if you are able, um, we would love your support uh, as a Pulitzer Center champion. Um, it makes events like this possible. It makes uh, work like Brandon and Penn's possible. So, um, and in the box, um, which is a reminder, tickets are still available for that. Come to St. Louis this week. So um, Wednesday through Friday, really great performance. Um, it'll be at the big top uh, in St. Louis. So, um, you know, touching on some themes we've talked about today, as well as some others, um, you can learn more about that at pulitzercenter.org slash events. And finally, um, survey will follow the end of this webinar. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to help us improve events like these, but that's all for now. So thank you for joining us today. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your afternoon and week. Take care. Thanks.